Hi there class, this video covers some of the reasons VCs pass on investments, reasons that VCs often don't share with founders. Here's the agenda for the video. We'll recap the previous video and then jump into the untold reasons VCs say no. We discussed how the best performing investment in a fund outperforms the entire rest of the fund combined, and how this increases the pressure on VCs to look for companies that can be that fund-making investment. We talked about how the only way to make money as an investor is to be right about something most people are wrong about, as outlined in this 2x2 two two matrix. And we outlined the typical structure used by venture capital funds, including the 2 and 20 mechanism for how VCs make money. Finally, we reviewed convertible notes, what they are, how they work, and when they are used. That covers our recap. Now, we'll cover the top 12 reasons VCs say no that they most often don't tell you. Number one, VCs may say no if you aren't swinging for the fences. At this point in the course, you understand that VC investing is a risky proposition. Most startups don't make it. Therefore, most VC investments turn out to be failures. For a VC to make money, the few winners have to make up for a lot of losers. Marketing and advertising pioneer John Wanamaker said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I just don't know which half. Well, VCs are in a similar boat, trying to figure out which companies in their portfolio are going to be those all-important winners. You've got to at least look like your company could be a big winner. In other words, if you aren't swinging for the fences, VCs literally can't afford to consider investing in your company. In that case, it's easy to calculate your probability of hitting a home run and of getting VC investment. Zero. Number two, hard to, it's hard to make a living at the horse track. Venture investing is somewhat like betting on horses. It's not purely gambling. In horse racing, you can learn how to judge horse flesh and jockeys, and the right odds can set you up for a windfall. But it's very hard to consistently pick winners, and you lose more often than you win. With startups, it isn't just about telling a good one from a bad one. All startups are by nature riddled with flaws that could become fatal. There's always a genuine reason not to invest. Take this website from Bessemer called The Anti-Portfolio. Bessemer claims to be one of the oldest venture capital firms in the world, and they post this list of deals they passed on as a way of illustrating how fallible they are and just how hard it is to be prescient about which deals win. No matter how good your deal is, there's a reason to say no. I'll highlight just a few. So down here at the bottom you can see Apple. Uh, Bessemer had the opportunity to invest in pre-IPO secondary stock in Apple at a $60 million valuation. Now think about that. This is the most valuable company in the world by market cap right now. Bessemer's Neil Brownstein called it outrageously expensive, valued at $60 million. Or how about eBay? Stamps, coins, comic books? You've got to be kidding. No-brainer pass. Or Facebook. Jeremy Levine spent a weekend at a corporate retreat in the summer of 2004, dodging persistent Harvard undergrad Eduardo Severin's rabid pitch. Finally, cornered in a lunch line, Jeremy delivered some sage advice. Kid, haven't you heard of Friendster? Move on, it's over. Or how about FedEx? Incredibly, BVP passed on FedEx seven times. Or Google. I mean, how can it be bigger than passing on Google? Cowan's, Cowan's one of their partners. Cowan's college friend rented her garage to Sergey and Larry for their first year. In 1999 and 2000, she tried to introduce Cowan to these two really smart Stanford students riding a search engine. Students, a new search engine? In the most important moment ever for Bessemer's anti-portfolio, Cowan asked her, how can I get out of this house without going anywhere near your garage? Or how about PayPal? David Cowan passed on the Series A round. Rookie team, regulatory nightmare. And four years later, a $1.5 billion acquisition by eBay. Or Tesla. In 2006, Byron Dieter met the team and test drove a Roadster. He put a deposit on the car, but passed on the negative margin company, telling his partners, it's a win-win. I get a great car and some other VC pays for it. The company passed $30 billion in market cap in 2014. And Byron recently paid full price for his Model X. The moral of the story is that VCs are justifiably picky, and there's always a legitimate reason to say no. 
That's tough to swallow when you're a founder and something outside your control prevents you from getting the money you need to grow your company. But often founders just need to accept that the rationale may or may not be there and it may or may not make sense to them. Sometimes you just got to move on. Number three, the cream didn't rise or didn't rise fast enough. You've probably gathered by now that VCs have to be on the lookout for big winners. Sometimes the reason a VC says no is because it wasn't obvious enough, fast enough, that your company might be one of these big winners. But sometimes it's the competition for that exclusive top spot that makes the difference. Remember, VCs screen a lot of deals, but invest in relatively few. If your company is the third best deal they're reviewing, you might get a pass. If your company is awesome, but just not the top choice among the deals the VC is evaluating right now, that can be the difference between getting investment or not. If it takes too long, or for some reason your company doesn't rise to the top of the list, it's likely the VC will pass. You're probably not going to know who you are competing against, or what the factors were that ultimately tipped the scales against you. Since there isn't a lot you can do about that, your best bet is to stay focused on relentlessly building the best company you can. Number four, you lost momentum. Momentum matters in the VC community. A sense of inevitability around your company builds fear of, fear of missing out, FOMO, and signals to investors that yours is a train that they need to be on. Momentum matters both in your company's pace for hitting milestones and the critical mass of your relationship with prospective investors. Now don't be annoying, but don't allow the pace of your contact and interaction to stall out. That can be a difficult line to walk and means you have a lot of timing issues to navigate. What's your timing in the market? What's the timing of your company's milestones? Where's the urgency? And where should it be? When we were raising a Series A for a company I was with, we started in this awkward phase where our ARR, right, our annual recurring revenue, was on track to be 200% year over year of what we'd done the year before. And we just inked a key partnership deal that would double our revenue for the year. The problem, these revenues were tied to the academic calendar and wouldn't materialize until that fall, eight months later. Key performance measures were in place, the work was done, and nothing else was required on our part. But the timing was off for us to show the momentum we felt inside the company. Ultimately, we used the spring and summer period to plant seeds with prospective investors and painfully waited until fall to kick our fundraising into high gear. This allowed us to paint an up-and-coming story with investors, which was borne out as the revenues we had secured materialized. We easily could have made the mistake of going out to raise without momentum, which would have been injurious to the business and our fundraising prospects. The bottom line is that VCs are human beings. Human beings sometimes behave like magpies and are quickly distracted by shiny new things. If your deal slips into the old news category, you have a much harder job of trying to breathe life and excitement back into it in order to secure investment. Number five, no dry powder. The timing within the life cycle of a VC fund affects how deals are evaluated. A typical VC fund is created with a 10-year lifespan. We talked about this in the last video. The first half of the fund, both in time and dollars, is for making new investments, while the latter half is for follow-on investing and pushing deals to exit in order to finalize returns to the fund's investors as the fund draws to a close. A new fund is raised each two to four years. As a result, VCs often don't have a constant availability of capital to invest. There are questions like, would this deal fit better in the new fund we're raising than the one we're in? Is this deal appropriate for that final deal to cap this fund off? Is the VC distracted by issues related to raising the new fund? All of this means two things to founders. First, the life cycle timing of a fund can affect the attractiveness of your deal to the fund. It's important. Second, there's only one way to discover anything about a particular VC's fund life cycle, and that is to ask them. In my experience, it's really uncommon for this information to be volunteered, but it's generously offered when asked. VCs are constantly on the lookout for great deals, so they won't necessarily balk at taking a call or appointment with you, even if they have no dry powder to make an investment. So you want to find out early on, does the VC have dry powder? If they don't, there's a good chance they'll tell you no. Number six, the Goldilocks principle. When a VC fund is created, it has a set of governing documents, a charter or an operating or partnership agreement, which spells out how the fund will operate. VCs typically focus on a fairly narrow band in terms of investment amount, as correlated to company stage. A minimum or maximum investment size may be spelled out in the documents, such as no single investment will be over $5 million, or, or, or a no investment will be greater than a certain percentage of the total size of the fund. 
As a result, VCs can't have their deals too big or too small. Just like Goldilocks, the deal size needs to be just right. Find out whether the amount you're looking to raise is within the allowable and typical deal size for the VC. If you're outside the sweet spot, they may have no choice but to say no. A good way to discover this is go to their website, look at the press releases about deals they've done, see what kind of amounts they've invested in the past. Number seven, industry alignment. VC fund documents or management philosophy may limit investment activity to certain industries. VC VC firms may choose to invest only in technology companies, for example, such as Greylock Partners famously does. Or maybe they focus on software as a service or biotech, medical devices, real estate, um, B2B manufacturing, etc. If a VC isn't active in your space, then you're wasting your time asking them to invest in your company. The key is to know what sectors your VC is active in so they don't have to tell you no and you can focus your energy on investors where you have industry alignment. Number eight you're in the wrong place. VCs may limit their investing to certain geographies. You need to approach those who are investing in your area or move your company to a place where investors are active. The highest concentration of VCs is on the coasts. Silicon Valley in Northern California has more VC activity than any place else in the world bar none. In the East, New York and Boston are the hubs. Some VCs in these areas will invest anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world, but some like to stay close to home. Less prominent communities still may have a strong startup ecosystem, such as Austin, Texas, or right here in Salt Lake City. Um, It's typical for these communities, however, to have more local funding for early investments like Series C and Series A, while often companies must turn toward the coasts when it's time to raise a larger round. In any case, being in the wrong place is a reason that VCs say no. Number nine, the portfolio mix. As a founder, a round of investment is a singular thing. You raise money one round at a time. You aren't often raising multiple rounds at once. But this is not true for your investor. VCs invest the capital from their funds in a portfolio of companies. While invisible to you, the relationship between companies in the portfolio can be very important to the VC. They may have already invested in a competitor, in which case they're unlikely to fund you. Or they may be looking for synergies between portfolio companies where there's a mutual benefit. They may be looking for companies to shore up other dynamics between portfolio companies, such as exit horizon, access to talent, or access to technology. If they don't see what they're looking for in terms of portfolio construction, that can be a reason you get a no. Number 10, an ugly capital stack. The required capital structure changes to clean up an ugly capital stack can add time, legal expense, and the potential for existing shareholders who are unsupportive of corrective measures. Messiness, prospective hassle, and expense are turnoffs for investors. Capital structure corrections are common, but given the choice between otherwise equal but given the choice between otherwise equal companies, one that requires extensive correction to its capital structure and one that doesn't, VCs are likely to avoid the hassle. Cleaning a messy capital structure is something you may want to tackle before you approach investors. If an IPO is the potential exit, your capital stack may contain problems that need to be fixed before the price of your shares and the number of shares required for the public float are right for a successful entry into the public markets. Number 11, lack of social proof. VCs, like the rest of us, are influenced by those around them. Whether it's recommendations on Amazon or Yelp reviews, we feel more confident in making decisions when we see others making the same decision. Psychologists tell us that we're wired to look to others for signals as to what the correct behavior is in any situation. So social proof comes into play in at least two ways, introductions and initial investments. As a founder or entrepreneur, it's better to get an introduction to investors than to just send cold emails or walk up to someone and introduce yourself at a conference. An introduction comes with the tacit recommendation of the one making it, a subconscious disarming that says, hey, this new person is okay. Some of the best introductions can come from a current investor or a warm introduction from the CEO of one of the investor's portfolio companies. If you can get either of those, that's the best. When it comes to first investments, I've seen this time and again, no investor wants to be the first kid in the pool. It's much easier to invest when another investor is already in the deal or when you know others are seriously looking. Remember that scene from Silicon Valley where the phone call from Peter Gregory motivates Gavin Belson to dramatically up his offer? This is poking fun at how dramatically social proof influences investors. Now, the show might be fiction, but the principle is spot on. 
You're far better off to have interest from at least one other investor when you start your conversations in earnest. Interest from the first prospective investor adds immeasurably to the comfort of those who follow. Ideally, you got two or more investors chasing you right up through your first investment, providing the confidence to each other that your company is a hot item. Conversely, lack of social proof makes VCs afraid everyone else knows something they don't, and they wonder why nobody else is interested. Either way, lack of social proof can be the reason you get a no. Number 12. You're missing a champion within. As you build a relationship with a VC firm, you're likely to meet multiple people at the firm who are serving in various roles. It's common for VCs to have an investment committee where partners sponsor prospective deals. Throughout the process, you need to establish someone inside the firm to be your champion. This is the person who's likely to go to bat for your company and win internal support for issuing a term sheet and shepherding your deal through the due diligence process to funding. Make sure that your champion never regrets sticking his or her neck out for your company. Lacking a champion within, your chances are far greater that you'll come away with a no. Now, I said there were only 12, and I've highlighted 12 reasons VCs say no, but sometimes you need to say no as well, so I've included this as a bonus reason. One of the hardest things for a founder is to turn down bad money, especially if you've pursued a long process with a VC. It can be hard to say no when the term sheet comes in. You want to remember that if you sell 30 or 40% of your company, that means your company needs to generate an extra 30 or 40% in return when it sells just for you to break even where you would have been if you hadn't taken investment. Sometimes bigger isn't always better. I recently heard of two local companies. One raised lots of money as it grew, and it ended up selling to a Fortune 500 software company for almost $2 billion. A success story for sure. The other also grew quickly but chose to avoid raising money and ended up selling for less than $200 million. But here's the kicker. The founder of the second company took home more money in the sale of the company than did the founder of the first. Understanding your ultimate goals and what is reasonable for a company like yours can help inform your sense of when terms represent workable compromises versus unreasonable requests. You should know when something is a deal breaker for you. Always remember, it can be terrible to be tied to bad money. That covers everything for this video. I will catch you on the next video.